Now, we're going to talk about why it's called conversational grease in a moment. As Eldred had said, I run two factories. I had eight direct reports and about 200 people under me. And yes, from time to time, we will have direct reports fighting. Okay. In fact, only last month, I had this particular person. Let's call him, let's say, Joe and Aaron. And they had an argument. They had a heated argument and they cannot have an agreement. So this guy, Aaron, called me up. Joe and I had a heated argument. Can you help? I said, all right, call Joe over. Let's have the three of us talk it out and let's see what we can do. Now, this gives us the concept of conversational friction. We're in. We will always have friction. In real life, there's always friction, right? Some paper, striking a match, that sort of thing. And if you have undesirable friction, what will happen? You will have, of course, heat. That's why you have heated arguments, because there's friction. The other one will be, there will be wear and tear. Don't you find it tiresome? You will always have these problematic people. You'll always have these issues left and right, unresolved. It tends to bog you down. And worst of all, if let's say there is unresolved resentment or anger, there's a breakdown of relationships. That's why we need to use lubricants. And we have this very clever technology wherein we're going to have you, whether you are a leader or a manager, where if you have two people under you, two or more actually, who are in feuding, this will be three simple techniques and three sample questions how to smooth in it, kind of conversation grease. Who's in control? It's you. Okay, the ground rule here, very precious. If there's one thing you need to enforce in this particular exercise, it is this. One person talks at a time. Only one person talks at a time. You may want to have visual techniques. There are other people who say, okay, I have this flag. Okay, I, let's pretend this is a flag. Whoever holds the flag is the one talking. If you're not holding a flag, you don't talk. That's another technique, which is bonus here. And by the way, even if you're not a team leader, you can also be in control with a peer. Whether you have an argument, a few with a peer or with two other peers, the techniques of this particular webinar will be valuable for you. So remember, who's in control? You, because you will enforce one person talks at a time. Now, in the talking, what will happen? Have you ever wondered what would be the three major resentments in any conversation? I would identify three common friction. Number one, you're not listening. Does that sound familiar? The other one, you're listening, but you don't understand me. You think you understand me, but you don't. Last but not least, you're not helping. I need help. I need advice. Tell me what to do. How do we get around this impasse? And that's where we'll have three particular friction and three different grease points and the principle why it works and a sample question which you can play around with. Let's start with the first. You are not listening. Okay. So the first one is, of course, the first grease is to listen. And the principle is this. Some of you may view it for the first time when you ask the other person to talk. Okay. You are externalizing the issue. You're externalizing the issue and what happens, you will be able to have a lower temperature because it's going to be now outside of the people involved. So the sample question is what's on your mind? So the first thing is to ask what's on your mind? How does it work? Well, imagine you have two people under you. And as I said, they're feuding. Like in my case, Joe and Aaron, wherein I will ask Aaron, he's the one who initiated it. I need help. All right, then we brought the two guys together. And my first gambit will be this. So Aaron, what's on your mind? Now notice the subtlety of this. Aaron, what's on your mind? Notice what happens. When that person goes into the room, he brings the issue inside him, right? And it's like something personal for him. He has an agenda. It's something precious. To him. Otherwise, why have the argument? And many people will have this mindset where it is an issue, my issue. I want to be proven right. Or no, 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 I don't want to be proven wrong. And therefore, if you challenge my statements, I will feel the need to defend to death. Or it may be something I feel it's unfair, unfair to me especially, and I'll protest to death, whatever it is. So notice, chances are, in any argument, in any friction, there is an issue where a person or both of them has a personal emotional stake. 
And what happens will be the technique is you invite the person, the one who starts the conversation, to what's on your mind. And yes, the idiom is like, get it off your chest. And then you put it on a table. Now, there's a particular expression which you can hear from coaching circles. Put it on the table. Why? Take a look at my hands. Huh? So what's on your mind? Then here's the issue. Okay, Aaron, I understand this is the issue. The issue is this. Notice what I'm doing with my hand. Very subtly, I'm telling Aaron, okay, the problem now is out in the open. It's now outside of your chest. We can have a look at it, and hopefully we can look at it objectively. And the technique is that we're going to frame the discussion. We refer to it as the issue, not your issue, his argument, the issue. The issue so that it seems to be like an object that is to be studied. And therefore, other than Joe, the two feuding guys, or you, or the other guy, will be able to see it from a more objective point of view. Now, that's the secret. First of all, externalize the issue. Try to detach the emotional bonds of the issue from the stakeholders involved. The other one is this. The next one is, remember, you don't understand me. So, of course, the next risk is to understand and here's how to do it. It is to examine the issue from several angles. Because remember, an issue usually has several facets, several sides of the story. And therefore, the question is this, what is your point of view? Take note, I didn't say, what's your side? Because when you identify a side, all the more you're enforcing an emotional state. So point of view, you already have the issue in front of you. What's your point of view? I see it from this side from that side, from that side. And the objective is this. You want the other person to be understood. Now, i like to add something here. This is something which will be invaluable for your conflict resolution. Understand why do people want to be understood? It's not just mere listening or intellectual agreement. There's an emotional state of wanting to be understood. And when you hit that stake, you'll be able to accelerate the discussion. Many times in my experience, when a person says, I want to be understood, if you look below the surface, that's what he says. But if you look below the surface, especially if he admits to it when you ask him, the reason why I want you to understand me is because when you understand me, I feel respected. Yeah? Imagine if you're talking and I interrupt you in the midpoint. What do you feel? You feel violated, disrespected. I didn't give due consideration to you. I was not empathetic. Or I want to feel valued. I want to be heard. I want to feel that I have a contribution to this company. I have this particular state of the solution. That's why please, please, please understand my point of view. Behind an appeal to be understood can be a cry for help. I want to be respected. I want to feel valued. I want to feel important somehow i matter when you have this mindset all the more and it shows because you cannot fake empathy all the more your conversation grease will be effective so what will happen there is this thing called the rashomon effect and for those who are not familiar check it out in google rashomon is a famous japanese film where it is there's one event and there are different witnesses but the witnesses give different sides to the story sometimes even contradicting each other and the explanation is this, you have one story, one event objectively, but different people interpret it different ways because they have a different bias. They saw the event at a particular time or they have talked to other people that color their perception. And here is one important thing for us to realize, same issue, but can be different points of view. Joe has a different point of view of the issue, okay? Aaron has a different point of the issue. I'll tell you what's the issue later on as we integrate them together. Remember, the Rashomon effect says that people tend to describe the same event differently. They're not lying. They're actually truthful from their own perspective. It can be partly part of the truth, the objective truth. And therefore, it's because of their way they see the world, the way they see themselves, and the way, of course, they have their own personal interests. That's why the nine here if you see it upside down, it's a six. Who is correct? Both can be correct because if the same issue, one perspective says six, one pers perspective is nine, and they're both correct. That's the Rashomon effect in simple terms. And therefore, what is your objective in Greece number two? What's your point of view? Invite each one 
to describe his point of view. What is your point of view? I see six. What about you? I see nine. And then you invite the other person. Do you see that guy? You see a nine, but the other guy says a six. Do you understand his point? Yeah, you know, when he when you point out, yeah, I can see why he's looking at it as a six. Vice versa. You are a six. You see the other, you hear the other person say it's a nine. Why do you think it's a nine? I see his point, why it's a nine. So the important thing is this, that one particular issue that different people involved can be able to see each other's perspective. That's very important. The other person should be able to see each other's perspective. Otherwise, that person will insist that his perspective is the best, the only one, or correct. You have to break that impasse. And that's why you have to ask the different people, what is your point of view? And what that happens, when that happens, you will be able to summarize what's going to be, you're going to summarize, my clicker is not working. So you're going to, be able to summarize and even synthesize a panoramic view, so to speak. Okay, so I hear both of you, you say six, you say nine, but as we've seen, both of you have a point. It's now a matter of how you see it. And therefore, let's have a look. It can be a figure that can be both a six or a nine. And people will see the issue more holistically. I'll give you the example later to show you how the theory is implemented. Now, what happens is this. In the last one is that you brainstorm. You're not helping. So what do we do? Notice what we're going to do next. We're going to explore what can we done. And the technique is to ask the simple question, what do you propose? Many times we feel inadequate to resolve a relationship problem because we thought we're supposed to be the one with the answers. But the other technique is like this. Can you tell me what you think should be done? Throw that burden back to him. And who knows, he may have the answer or he may have a better answer than yours. And what's going to happen? Notice this other psychological technique. Your workhorse question is not how, it is not why, it is what. Notice when you ask what, you tend to spur more creativity than how. Feel free to talk in the chat box, why is that? But in how, have you noticed that if I ask you how, chances are your mind will thinking step one, step two, step three. But if you ask what, a lot of other things can happen overall picture, what will be the benefits, what will be the options, what will be the things that we have to do next. Big picture, then we talk about the how. That's why the what tends to spur more discussion and creativity. The what can be wider, the how can be, so one, two, three, how do we do this? No, what do we do? And you may have a lot of other answers to play with. The other one is that you ask what, not why. Because have you ever had experience that somebody asks you, why did you do that? And for some reason, we have this gut feel or this knee-jerk reaction that we feel we have to justify ourselves. We have to defend ourselves. Why did you do that? Because this, this, this. And then when you're attacked, you dig into your heels and then deny to death or defend to death. But if you ask, what were the reasons that you did that? Notice that difference. Why did you do that versus what are the reasons that you did that? The what tends to be safer, more objective. It tends to bring the issue, not the why, the motivation part, but the what were the reasons out there. Remember, you're externalizing the issue. So the technique here is to ask what. Have you noticed what's on your mind? What's your point of view? And what do you propose? There are what questions. So you may want to try this after lunch instead of asking why or how, what can be done? And this is your starting point. What do you propose? And as the discussion goes, you may want to refine it by having this. The strength of the ideas will be, what do you like about the idea? Notice again, the psychology. It's not what do you like? It's not what do you think about the idea because people may think it's okay, but they may have some emotional reasons about it. And that's why the question is couched this way. What do you like about the idea? Because if they like the idea, there will be implicit buy-in. Oh, I like it because it makes my job easier. Oh, I like it because it's going to lower costs. 
And when you say, when a person says, I like it, you're already one step of the way to have that consensus building or the buy-in. Now, if you want to talk about the disadvantage of the idea, especially in brainstorming where people tend to shoot down ideas, one of the way to go around it is to ask this question. What can we do to make the idea better? Notice that it does not attack the idea. It does not shoot down the idea, but it says, okay, there's this idea. There is some good thing about it. But rather than criticize it to death, why it will not work, why it's a not a good idea, you then ask, okay, what can we do to make the idea better? And what will happen is that you will have the option of having several ideas with their own pros and cons, and then you can synthesize it later. So what do you propose? Explore what can be done. The key is that you explore what is positive and what is possible. I'm sure you have many people say, that's a big problem. I don't see how we can solve it. We have no budget. We have no manpower. But now the principle is explore what can be done. If both persons offer separate solutions, see if you can synthesize a third one that has the advantages of the two. And you may want to do this clip. I like the first idea because one, two, three. Now, you don't say but. Okay? You don't go to the next idea and say but why? Because the but has a tendency to negate what was said before. I love your cooking but... I love your report, but have you noticed there's a certain downer for the but? So try to avoid the but. And you may want to, if you want to have a filler word, use and. I like the first idea because one, two, three. And I like the second idea also because four, five, six. So what if we combine the two ideas so that we have one, four, six, or one, three, five, wherein we now have at least a synthetic idea which carries both the pros and minimizes the cons. Here is the other thing. Wait, there's more. Okay, because here is one other thing I like to add. We have three sample questions. What's on your mind? What is your point of view? What do you propose? You as the leader, remember you're in control. One person talks at a time. Here is one way to make it even more greasy. The answer is this. You paraphrase and check. You paraphrase Aaron, you paraphrase Joe, you paraphrase this person, that person, and you ask this other question, the bonus question, did I get you right? Yes, I'm aware this is a close-ended question, whereas you'll notice the other three, the what questions are open-ended. But this one gives you a check, a reality check, wherein the advantage is that if you paraphrase the other person, and if you got it right, the other guy feels heard, feels heard, and feels help. And what happens is that to make this template complete, here is the complete picture. And feel free to give a screenshot wherein the three frictions are. You're not listening. The first one is L, listen. You externalize the issue by asking what's on your mind. Then when you paraphrase the question, okay, what I hear from you, what's on your mind is X, Y, Z. Did I get you right? Yeah, you got it, you got it, you got it. Okay. The second one is, you don't understand me. And so I would then try to explain, ask you to explain the issue. And I ask the other guy to explain, the other guy to explain, and then what's your point of view? And then, okay, Joe, if I understand you correctly, this is your point. Yeah? Yes. Aaron, is this your point also why you disagree with Joe? Not so quite, Sir Nelson. Okay, then he explains further. Then I will say, okay, let me paraphrase it better. This, this, this. Did I get it right? Yes, Nelson. Finally, you got it right. And everybody gets the complete picture. The role of the leader, which is you, is not just to facilitate the discussion, lower the temperature, but also to make each other feel that he was heard and understood. And you are modeling that. Did I get you right? I understood you. I hear you. Help me up here. Help me understand. I believe you said this, this, this. Did I get you right? Yes, Nelson. Spot on. Okay, now we can proceed with the discussion. Aaron, your side is like this, like this. Did I get you right? Joe, do you understand? That will now be a mutual understanding where people have clarity. Because with confusion comes friction as well. Last but not least, you're not helping. We're in the principle is to brainstorm and explore what can be done 
and you know ask what do you propose and then if somebody says i propose this that's a good idea if i understand correctly we will do this 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 did i get you right yeah that's what you can do and then who knows the other guy say i like the idea and we can add to it this 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 or you know that idea may work but i'm worried about this this is but instead of shooting it down okay aaron you've seen some potential problems in that idea what do you think we can do to work around it and then the discussion gets to be more and more productive rather than deadlock and then people argue they shout at the top of their lungs and nothing happens and then lastly when you now have the synthesized idea did i get you right now here is going to be the actual conversation remember i'm going to give you a summary i don't have to give you the blow by blow basically when aaron called me up joe and i had a heated argument aaron was the planning head he's the one who schedules the production okay he tells us what are we going to make at a particular time at what machine and what happens like this he was under pressure by sales to produce a prototype and the production head joe refuses sir nelson what joe and i had a heated argument why i want to make this product but joe the product had refuses and of course i would ask for the background why is it important because it's going to let's say open a new business for us and so now as i said let's gather the tree together and then we have each other's point of view aaron the production head Aaron, the planning head, said, we need a special run because sales need this prototype to get new business. However, Joe, the production head, yeah, but that takes down time. There's change over. We have to shut down the machine and reset the settings so that we'll be able to make prototype. XL costs six hours. Can you imagine six hours the machine is idle? What can we do with that six hours? We'll miss our KPIs. And of course, I would then paraphrase Aaron and Joe. Did I get it right? Did I get you right? Now, that's where everybody felt their side was hurt. So planning head, I don't say, oh, now I understand why Joe is resisting because he's worried about his KPI. He's worried about the six hours. Here's a point. The six hours is in Tagalog, sayang. Then from Joe's point of view, now I know why I was insisting on the prototype X. The reason is because it's potential profit and he wants to help sales. When these two people see each other's point of view, then they can harmonize their objectives. And so what do you propose? We brainstorm. What can we do? And then credit to Aaron. Remember, he's the production, he's the production planning. He's the planning head. Can we look at the production plan together? Let's review. Let's see the big picture. Okay, let's have the overview again. Let's have the big picture. What can we do? And then the production head, Joe, said, okay. I noticed next week we're going to produce this particular SKU. It is very close to prototype X. Can we pick it back on it? Mean to say that instead of six hours, we can do only two hours change over because it's similar. You do minimal tweaking of the machine. And then the dead in KPIs is acceptable. I can summarize that. Okay, what I hear from the two of you guys is that we have the opportunity to piggyback it next week using a similar KPI and therefore reduce our downtime and you'll be able to get Aaron what you want prototype X and it's okay Joe Joe it's okay yeah it's okay I'm agreeable and therefore Aaron will say thank you it's okay for me for next week I'll negotiate with sales because it's also to their interest that we don't waste the six hours because of the conversation grease things went smoothly instead of heating up Notice the power of those three things. What's on your mind? What's your point of view? And what do you propose? It is a conscious use of the grease by which you'll be able to smooth and practically every conversation. Now, as we said, remember, though I'm showing my age, if you're going to have another discussion, especially a difficult one, trying to reconcile two people, remember, grease is the word. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. Okay, I'm showing my age. If so you may know that movie or play. Now, I have a breaking news for you. I have been a performance coach for LJMB, and some of you have already had discovery calls with me. I am pleased to announce that I have my certification from a very reputable firm called 
Coach Masters Academy. I'm a professional level for transformative coaching. The other one is this. Feel free to check out my three career books if you like this particular webinar on how to advance your career in this case. Advancing your communication skills. There's a lot more. There's more. There's much more through these three books. Your first job, your career roadmap, and soaring high. Last but not least, I don't want us to say bye-bye for now. I like to think of it as we keep the channels open. Follow me at this Facebook page, LinkedIn. I'm more active in LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I have an email wherein you can reach me for anything. If you need advice or a discovery call to be made, email me at gmail, nelsontd.com at gmail.com. Why nelsontd.com? Because that's also my website. Visit my website because we'll also talk about a lot of other things, not just about career, purpose in life, relationships, spirituality. It's there. And you can find out more about me, my books, and other resources in that website. Meantime, I do hope you learn several good things here which you can implement right away. Remember, what's on your mind? What's your point of view? What do you propose? And the magic grease overall. Did I get you right? And hopefully, you'll have a lot less friction. And when there are sparks, they're not sparks of heat. They're sparks of joy.